Hey, what's up guys? Tugi here, back again with another episode of my San Jose Sharks franchise mode series right here on NHL 20. And today, we see if this team will be able to keep up the great pace that they have been on through the first half of the season. You would have seen it there. We're in first place in the division, 12 points clear of the Kings with the game at hand. Things are looking very, very good for us. Whether or not that, you know, whether or not that maintains, we shall see. Before we get down to business, though, a couple of your comments that I want to get to. This isn't an every episode kind of thing, but when there are comments I want to directly address, we uh, we do that. So let's get down to it. Flyers for life, as far as changing player types. I'm going to continue to optimize player types, and I'll tell you why. It's because when I don't, people call me out for not doing it. And it's only going to be worse this year when... You know, people know, like, hey, if you were to just change this guy to this player type, you'd get the boost. Bottom line for me, and I've talked about this before, when it comes to this game, I would love for there to be, you know, automatically defined player types based off of attributes. So you look at Logan Couture. He can be a two-way, a playmaker, a sniper. So, yeah, you'd be kind of dumb not to assign what makes sense given who his line mates are, what his, you know, what his role is on that line in terms of the strategies that you see there. You'd just be doing yourself a disservice to not do that. And I get your point, go out and get somebody that fits the role already, but there's a lot of player types that can certainly be debatable. And actually, Riley Walker responded to you, and I completely agree. Think about how long Max Pacioretty was a power forward rather than a sniper, for example. So again, for me, until they change it, I think the ideal you know situation for player types moving forward in franchise mode would be for a player to have their preferred type and then a secondary type where they could also be, you know, at least efficient. Maybe they're not as efficient at that role. Because if you think about it, yeah, if you ask Logan Couture to be a pass-first option or a pass-first player... He's going to be successful at it. If you ask him to be the sniper on his line, he's going to be successful. If you ask him to be a little bit more defensive, he'll be able to do that. And I think most players, you know, would succeed. Now, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say, Barclay Goodrow, be a sniper. But, you know, in the game sense, if it were to be like, oh, Goodrow is ideally a grinder, but can also be a decent two-way, that would be cool. And those are the two player types that we've, you know, given to him thus far this season. Surprise, surprise, he's succeeding a little bit more as a fourth line grinder rather than a third way, you know, third line two way. So I am still going to change player types. Trust me, if someone's not working out, we're going to be making moves. You know, the point is to not change this team up to an unrecognizable state immediately. That's why we had a poll about Patrick Marlowe. And that's why, you know, while I wasn't certain signing Ben Hutton was the right move, it's ultimately why we signed him, and it has worked out pretty well. So, yeah, that's still going to be happening. TNT Ninja, as far as turning down injuries, that's been that's been done. I still want injuries to be on in this series. Now, someone else pointed this out. I don't know if I remember to put this comment up, but I put it down to nine, which is what worked out very well last year as well. We'll see what happens. I like injuries to be on for the randomness factor. Maybe from now on it'll just be a playoff thing. I don't know. We'll see what the frequency is moving forward. And last one, we actually need to go back into the line. Uh, Bolts hockey. Uh, as far as the defensive pairs are concerned, here's here's the thing. I get criticized a lot for changing the team when we're doing relatively well. So now that we're doing well, I'm not going to change the team because... <laughs> People will just get mad, and it doesn't make sense. Now, look, I get it. In theory, yeah, Vlasic and Carlson as a third pairing doesn't make sense. But you can't tell me that it wouldn't be a realistic thing or a smart thing for the Sharks to not play Eric Carlson 22 minutes a night in the regular season. People have been talking about that for the past year, really, since he's gone to the Sharks, that he should be a little bit more sheltered. So I, I gotta I gotta disagree with you in that it's not realistic to shelter Carlson a little bit. It makes all the sense in the world. And then come playoff time, my God, he's 100% healthy. He's a killer. As it is, he's still putting up points because of the power play time. So again, I, I have to disagree with you on that one. And I think again, the team overwhelmingly benefits from having the current setup that we have and again if you look at Brent Burns he's still getting over 20 minutes a night Dylan's getting 19 and a half like I get it yeah Ben Hutton and Tim Heed getting that much ice time kind of risky but 
it, it's staying. <laughs> I don't mind changing things, as the injury slider will tell you. I don't mind changing things, but I gotta be honest with the, you know, the not changing player types and the changing up the lines. Until this team starts to go on a downward spiral, we're gonna leave it as is. Because again, I always, I, I just get, I, I get criticized all the time. Like, man, why'd you change stuff? You were winning. You, you're too, you're too, you know, ready to just jump and change things, and you make tedious changes and stop. And then when I don't, people are like, but it's unrealistic to not do it. I can't win. <laughs> I can't win, is the point. Except I can, because this team is doing very well as we hit 30 wins on the season after losing to Pittsburgh. We went four straight before losing to Dallas. So, like I said, we'll continue to tinker around with things if we need to, but as far as the player type system is concerned, I think that needs to just be outright changed by EA. And when it comes to the Lions, Eric Carlson, dude, it's just, I want... I want him to be healthy for the playoffs, as Chris Kreider has been traded to the Anaheim Ducks for Michael Delzato, a second and a fourth. Rangers fans, he's back. Run for cover. Michael Delzato back in New York. That is a low, low price, too. Really? Is Kreider... Is Kreider UFA? I mean, that would explain it if his, if his value's down a little bit. If he's not a UFA, though, I can't I can't explain that at all, actually. So let's take a look. I don't see why the... I mean, the Ducks bought, which is kind of crazy. Where is Kreider? And they want to trade him already. Okay, so he's on an expiring contract. It makes sense as to why his value would have been a little bit weaker. He's having a decent season, 31 points in 49 games, but... Huh. I don't... Totally hate that trade. I don't see why the Ducks are... You know, perhaps not the most unrealistic thing to see the Ducks still pushing to try and make the playoffs when they probably shouldn't. Just gonna say that. You know, agree or disagree. I don't... It, you know, if you want to talk about realism, uh, that's something that is on point. Much like Carey Price having a terrible save percentage. <laughs> oh, I love how many people got upset at that. It's like, it was sarcasm, guys. Calm down. Jesus, I would never offend the Lord and Savior, Carey Price. Now, we are a few weeks out from the deadline. 36, 13, and 3. Absolutely killing it. And we left the last episode and saying, I didn't know if there were any changes that we had to make. And I still feel the same way. I gotta be honest. I mean, we are just cruising in the Pacific Division right now. We are the top team in the NHL. Just on fire right now. Second best offense in terms of goals for per game. Goals against, we have the fewest. So I'm thinking, and we talked about eh, Martin Jones. I'm thinking Martin Jones has been on a good stretch over the past month. Our power play is actually down, though. Go figure. Our penalty kill is at least not terrible. Let's go take a look at the power play here. That's kind of surprising to know that they've stalled out. I mean, we're winning games, so if anything has to take a hit in terms of efficiency, I'm cool with it being the power play as long as we're still winning. But let's see what we have here. Now, I guess the question is, is Vander Kane... Yeah, he's still proven to be a little bit streaky. You want to talk about things in terms of realism. Uh, what if we do that? Uh, that's not great. What if we do this? Oh, hello plus five. I think, I think I like that. I think I like that a lot. Now, I don't know if I want Tim Heed on the power play. I don't mind Tim Heed. I'm just saying I don't know if I want Tim Heed on the power play. Uh, phew, God, we could go with Sorensen. I'm trying to think of who isn't there. Right? I mean, if you look at our top lines, it's pretty much just LeBanc and Source, and although LeBanc is there. Let's see if we take out Tim Heed. We bring in Marcus Sorensen, and we move Marlowe up to that top line. It did help out the the other line to have Sorensen down. Now, the reason to have Te uh, Teed, as I'm calling him from now on, the reason to have Tim Heed would have been to have another righty, because otherwise, it's just, it, it's not a thing. We don't have enough righties on this power play. Uh, let's see. Sorensen is a much better fit there. 
LeBanc, not so much. Is there anywhere we can move LeBanc around? That would make it a three. You know, I mean, a plus five on the top line. I mean, Marlowe on the top power play unit is not what I would have expected, but it can be done. Kevin LeBanc just doesn't seem to be a good fit pretty much anywhere on that power play. It's just for what he does on the power play, it just doesn't match up with what we need. So what if we take out LeBanc? We'll move Heat over there for the sake of the 1T. What if I swap Meyer and Couture? I think we're going to be capped at a plus 3, which is fine. Let's see, Sorensen was a perfect fit. Alright, we're going to be capped at a plus 3, but that's fine. Uh, taking Kevin LeBanc off of the power play is not ideal. But we'll see what happens there now that we've made some changes. And taking a look at the goaltending, a 908 for Jones is okay. I mean, Aaron Dell up to a 922, that's spectacular, but he's barely played, which is a little bit surprising. I guess that the auto rotate goalies hasn't been uh, that well utilized. But we'll see what happens here. Uh, let's let's sim two weeks. We'll go to that game against Minnesota, and we'll see what happens from there holy hell <laughs> so Kreider fetches the, uh, Goligoski is second in another minor pick or uh, yeah, Kreider Goligoski and Soderberg for two first round picks Jesus now I know Dallas's first round picks aren't going to be that valuable but damn compared to what Anaheim paid to get Kreider that's a questionable one. I'm going to try to pause this here. We'll see if another trade pops up. As we beat Calgary 1-0, up to 38 wins on the year. Anaheim, by the way, still outside of the playoffs. Where's Dallas right now? Dallas is in a wild card spot. The Coyotes, it makes sense that they traded away people to get picks. But Dallas only being in a wild card spot. Do you have an injury on defense? I, I have to know. I have to know. Kreider now on the top line. Kreider and Getzloff on the same line. Damn. What do we have here? So, I mean, they have Soderberg now as a third line center. Yeah, expiring for him. Yeah, expiring deal for Soderberg, too. Two first round picks? Really? Goligoski. Eh. <laughs> you know, that's. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to pretend that that's. Uh, that that's a good trade. <laughs> I don't. Again, there's been a lot of talks over the AI and their trade logic thus far in this game. That's one of those ones where I just, I, I can't, I can't explain that. 10-2 to win over the Oilers. We beat the Flames again. 40 wins on the year before the deadline. And there's another trade. Good God. Jared Spurgeon, Brad Hunt, and JT Brown for our first round pick and defensive prospect Cam York. So two first round picks for Goligoski and Soderberg, but one first, and I guess a good prospect for Spurgeon, Hunt and Brown, in fairness to those two. Of course, the second we start this series, Jared Spurgeon signs an extension because you knew that was going to happen. Not, to, I mean, he wasn't the only one. Miko Koivu's on the move as well. Calgary giving up Tyler Parsons a third and a fifth. So many, I mean, it's a fire sale in Minnesota right now. I'll be intrigued to see where they are in the standings by the time our little sim session here stops. Ron Haynes, oh no. <laughs> oh God, no. Oh, Don, what are you doing, Don? What are you doing? Ron Hainsey. Dan Girardi and a third. Ba basically, Ron Hainsey and Dan Girardi for a first round pick. Not ideal. I'm just going to say that. You go from picking up Coyle. Jesus Christ. You go from picking up Coyle and Marcus Johansson one year to that. Ugh. Thomas Vanek and David Savard to Florida for a first and a second round pick. The AI just willing to throw draft picks around like it's nothing. So Vanek went to Columbus. He's dealt alongside David Savard to the Florida Panthers, who we lost to 6-3. to three. And that brings us again to 41-14-4 on the year, up to 86 points. A 21-point lead with two games at hand. 
over the San Jose Sh- or over the San Jose Sharks over the Vegas Golden Knights. Of course, we had a series with the Golden Knights last year, so a bit of a Freudian slip there. Are we still the best team in the league? Yes, we are. Five points clear of the Hurricanes. Uh, power play percentage still isn't great, but I would imagine, I mean, obviously we're still scoring goals at a ridiculous pace just in terms of five-on-five five even strength, so I'm not too upset about it. Logan Couture now leading the way amongst forwards. Hurdle and Meyer looking all right. I mean, we have four guys that have hit at least 50 points. Marlowe has 44 points in 50 games. Again, Kevin LeBanc, I think, is the guy that really takes a hit this year in terms of his point production. But you look at Lucas Radil on the third line, you know, he should be he should be able to outscore Radil, and he's not. So, it, just in general, I mean, he's shooting 8.8% this year as well. He only had two points on the power play, so he really just wasn't efficient at all this year. He's having an off year offensively, and I can forgive that. Defensively, again... Say what you want about the minutes, but Burns and Carlson, both extremely effective. Extremely effective. And healthy, for that matter. Tim Heed, Ben Hutton having good years, Dylan 13 points. Only 26 penalty minutes for Brendan Dillon. I'm impressed. I mean, considering he hasn't posted under 60 in one season since 1516, <laughs> I'm fairly impressed. And Mark Edward Vlasic, we don't pay him to put up points. You know, doing well, shutting things down defensively. Goaltending wise, 906 for Jones and a 919 for Aaron Dell. I just don't see the point in changing anything with this team. What is there to change? We're doing so well. You know, you could talk about, like, oh, maybe someone a little bit better, like on the fourth line. Our coach only rolls three lines, so the fourth line's rarely used. Radil is ultimately doing well. Had he played the full season on the third line, he probably hit 30 points, which is, you know, the ideal target for a third liner. And, you know, he he might still hit that anyway, even though he's averaging under 10 minutes of ice time per game. Joe Thornton, still doing well. LeBanc is still doing well, even if he's not producing at as high of a level as we'd prefer. And I know that having Marcus Sorensen as a first liner is not ideal, but he's doing all right. So I think I'm cool with it. 34 points, that's not bad. The important thing is that he gives a boost to Marlowe and Evander Kane as well, who are both doing fine. So it, it would be tough to make a move and find someone who is a perfect fit like Sorensen. And again, if you were to move LeBanc up there, he's not a great fit for the first line. He's not even a great fit for the second line. Just in general, LeBanc does not fit in well with what our coach likes to do. It's it's not ideal. I like Kevin LeBanc. I want him to be here. But if you look at someone that we might have to move, is you know if we speaking as if we were to keep our coach, which I assume we would, it's a highly rated coach. You know, limited options, I would say, in terms of what to do with LeBanc in terms of playing him in an ideal top six role. And again defensively what's there to change? What's there to change? Brent Burns isn't a great fit. You know, first pairing D. Eric Carlson, middle of the road, it just kind of equals out. Unfortunately, again, what our coach prefers to do, it doesn't really match up with how Burns or Eric Carlson happen to play. Granted, with Eric Carlson, it evens out. But, again, even, you know, they're a plus one on the third pairing. But, again, Vlasic just doesn't really line up with what our coach likes to do. So, we're making the best of this situation here. There are moves that we can make, but I feel like they'd just be moves for the sake of moves. I gotta be honest. Why mess with the formula? Now, trust me, especially in the playoffs, I'm the first one to try and mess with the team if something's not going well. We're the best team in the league. I think we're just going to stick with it. The one thing we could do is look to bring in a little bit of extra depth. And actually, you know, I'm not I'm not against that. I mean, we have Johnny Brodzinski as a forward. And aside from that, we were looking at Kelman or Dylan Gambrell, who I don't want to call up this year just because, again, he was on waivers. And we saw that in the last episode uh, when we were going to call him up. I ended up going with Kelman instead. 
So a little bit of extra depth might not be the worst idea in the world. Ryan Merkley, up to a 72. I like it. And I mean, defensively, in terms of bringing in a little bit of extra depth, I mean, we did pick up Flurry, Simic still there. There might be somebody better to bring in, but they're both minor league top twos. So, I mean, the most, you know, the best we're going to get is someone between like a 77 and a 79. But we'll see what's out there. It's at least worth exploring who's out there and what we might be able to do. I really don't want to bring in Magnus Payarvi. All the, yeah, it's AHL. I was going to say, he's doing well. And then I saw the Gulls logo, and I'm like, that's why. Uh, Kevin Boyle, not exactly. Well, in terms of depth goalies, he's doing really well in the AHL. But put it this way, if Martin Jones goes down, we're probably screwed anyway. I mean, Shortridge is there, Bebo, Coronar. It's not a great situation in terms of depth goaltenders. Kevin Boyle might help in theory, but he's not going to help out that much. Is his deal up at the end of the year? It is. If we wanted to look for a backup, it could be Kevin Boyle. Let's look at skaters first, though. Bo Bennett, Michael Chaput, Russo. Eh. Bennett is playing in the NHL. Oof. Yep, that's, that's going to be a no for me, champ. And Michael Chapu, not doing that great either. Boston. They are shopping Vakanine and Frederick and Studnico, which isn't surprising. They're in go for it mode. Although I would cry if that happened. Bogosian is getting paid all the money for the rest of the year. He has barely played. Hunwick's in the AHL. I mean, you know, bringing in a veteran like Hunwick could help. How much better is he going to be than who we already have? Jake Bean's expensive as hell. Carolina's looking to shop all their prospects to try and win this year. Not surprising. Of course, they were in second place last we knew. Zach Smith? Not with two years left, buddy. I don't think so. It looks like most teams. I mean, Columbus isn't. But it looks like most teams are in, hey, let's, let's try to win now mode. Dubinsky is still, yeah, he's still under contract next year. That's not going to happen. Hannah Kynan hasn't been great. Columbus in general hasn't been great. Dallas, Rup Hines, Tufty, way too expensive for my blood. Glenn Denning, Erickson, no thanks. You can be, you can be stuck with that. Edmonton shopping, James Neal. Aside from that, we'd be looking at like Archibald. I mean, Edmonton's looking to get rid of anybody. Archibald's done well from a point, uh, point getting perspective. I want to check Edmonton's lines and see what he's up to. Like I said, he wouldn't fit into the team immediately. I mean, there are options out there, but in terms of price, I think we'll be okay. Because you look, too, Kelman did really well. He did really well when he actually got a chance to play. If it, It's Mike Smith. Ooh, nope, okay. You know what? We're sticking with it. We're sticking with it. Whether or not this proves to be a mistake, time will tell. But we're the best team in the league. Our depth is a bit questionable in certain spots. But for the most part, this should be a year to remember for us. Although anything can happen once you get into the playoffs. But in terms of trusting the depth that we have, in terms of trusting the team that we have in general, we're doing it. We're going to see how far this team can take us as we've lost three out of four. Make that four out of five. <laughs> oh boy as we go through deadline day. So there weren't any other big deals. They were all done before deadline day. Talk about a realistic uh, realistic portrayal of the deadline nowadays. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, we shall see what we'll do here. Logan Couture breaks his nose. Not great, but... We're going to see what Cal... Oh boy, two people got hurt. What? Okay, when did Sorensen get hurt and why did nobody tell me? Okay, that, that could be rough. That could be rough. We're going to bring in... Oh, boy. Can Kalman... Why wouldn't... Let me... Look, Kalman can play center. Let's bring in Kalman. That keeps it at a plus five, which is beautiful. And then how about Johnny Brodzinski... On the top line, it's still a plus one. 
LeBanc doesn't make it any better. Radil makes it a plus three. We're gonna leave Brodzinski there. That is rough. Especially depending on how long that injury lasts. What a... God, who the hell do I need to replace? Can I just bring in Kelman, I guess? He had done well when we had played him. I didn't even notice he was there. Go figure! We're doing all right on the injury front. I say we're going to trust our depth. Instant. Instant injuries. <laughs> this game listens to you and is damn well determined to ruin your life. As we lose 3-1 to one to Chicago, let's take a look really quickly at how uh, long those injuries are. Mainly Sorensen, who is out until the 25th. Okay, so neither will be out into April. We know Couture had a broken nose, saying it doesn't know how long he's going to be out for, but it shouldn't be that long, of course. So, we'll see what happens from there. We shall see. So, continuing onward towards the beginning of April... We'll see what ha- oh my god, thank god, it's the AHL, it's Hayden Flurry with an injured back. All, all of the injuries are happening right now, <laughs> what the hell, man? Johnny Brodzinski is hurt now. Isn't this fun? Thank god Logan Couture is back, he's not 100%, but we'll do what we gotta do, and then we'll have Kelman replace Brodzinski. And I think that gets it to a plus five on the top line. It does not. I mean, Logan Couture is going up to the top line now, isn't he? I think that's what's happening. Marlo Couture came. We'll have Kelman there with that plus five. Seems like the way to go. Cool. Oh, God. I, I hate how it's like, oh, replace the player in the line. But then it still makes you fix the power play for no reason. Because that doesn't factor in somehow. Not a fan of that. Couture, back in the line. I hate everything right now. Kelman. Good old Kel. Loves his orange soda. He is in on the power play. That's a plus three for the second unit. We move onward. 6 nothing win over Dallas. Hopefully Logan is back to 100% before this game against Colorado. And he doesn't get injured. But Lucas Radiel does. And he will be out until the first round with an MCL sprain. What the hell is happening? Talk about the depth and the injury luck, and then this happens. Jesus. All right. Who are we going to call up here, then? Alex True looks good to go. And calling up Gambrell might be the right way to go. Again, I prefer it to be someone who could not be claimed on waivers, but I know he'd fit in well from an offensive standpoint. True, the six foot five center. Currently a two-way, which makes sense. He should be a two-way or a grinder. And in terms of if I were to send down anybody, it would be Kelman. Hmm. Let's call up True and Gambrell. And Gambrell will pretty much be on the roster for the rest of the year. Whether a healthy scratch or in the lineup. So what I want to do here is let's plug in Alex True there. Keeps it at a plus one. Couture is not 100%, so I'm going to bring in Gambrell, who should probably be a, a playmaker or a sniper. Yeah, see, that's what I mean. There's no reason for Dylan Gambrell to be a two-way. He should be a playmaker or a sniper, but he's a two-way, so that's why we change player types. But the good thing is, he still keeps it at a plus three. Uh, I'm going to change him to a sniper to see if it gets it up to a plus five. You can hate me for that if you want to. And LeBanc, Thornton, and True are pretty much good to go. And that way we can keep the fourth line the same because we know that Melker didn't work out too well for us there. Although, Swomala. Alright. Here's what we're going to do. Gambrell. Gambrell. The Gamber. Nobody calls him that. But uh, Gambrell's going to be a sniper. Uh, we're going to have Swomala, Swomala, Swomala as a two-way. And True is going to be changed to a grinder to see how he fits in on that fourth line. Again, I didn't want to make a thousand changes, but here we are. 
pretty much had no choice as Hayden Fleury's back for the Barracuda, and we beat Montreal in overtime, but Logan Couture is back to 100%. Great. Great, great, great. Uh, so, what are we going to do here? What are we going to do? Kelman is such a good fit for no reason. <laughs> He really is. He's such a good fit on this team for no reason. I love it. Uh, let's bring in Couture again. And what we're going to do instead... What we're going to do instead is move Patty to be a sniper. To try and uh, utilize the most of that line. That second line... Kelman's such a good fit. What does Gambrell look like? If I were to move him... A playmaker. That's just, yeah, he doesn't fit as well on that line. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. So I think we'll have, we'll still have Kelman in there. I mean, the thing is, he's done well, or at least he had been doing well. He has six points in 13 games now. The hope is that he won't be in the lineup for that much longer. Hopefully he won't. So let's make a couple of quick changes here before this game against Boston. They're on 37 wins this year. We have already clinched the playoff spot with eight games to go, which is not surprising. We've clinched the division with eight games to go. So again, this team, you know, question the methods if you will, but this team has been quite successful this season. So, let's see if we can make the most of the boost from here. Oh, Patrick, you look so much better. So much better in this jersey. And it's a damn shame that they're not bringing you back. I hope they end up bringing him back. Like, Justin Williams isn't going back to Carolina, at least immediately. Hopefully, that's like a Mike Fisher situation where halfway through the year, he's like, never mind, I'm coming back to Nashville for one more run. Hopefully, you know, for Marlowe's sake, I mean, Williams already has his cup. Hopefully, cups. Uh, hopefully for William's sake, not William's sake, hopefully for Marlo's sake, if he goes back to San Jose, he's a bit more successful than Mike Fisher was. Sorry, Preds fans, but, I mean, you can't disagree with the sentence. I know you feel the same way. Right, let's move Alex True to be a grinder. Because, again, based off of, that, based off of his attributes, he should be a two-way, or he should be a grinder. It's pretty straightforward. So, let's see what we can do. Left wing, true, grinder. And we'll see what the line chemistry looks like from there as we sim the final eight games of this season. We are more keeping an eye out on what that playoff structure is ultimately going to look like and who we'll be up against in the first round. So, there you go. I mean, the top line now gets a plus three with Marlo Couture. That's not Evander Kane. There you go. With Marlo Couture and Kane. Second line of Meyer, Kelman, Hurdle works out really well. And then True, Goodrow, Carlson works out a hell of a lot better uh, than when Swamala was there, which is kind of surprising. But we'll see what those lines can do for us. Defensively, we're still looking good. The injuries to Brodzinski, Radil, and Sorensen affecting this lineup right now. And maybe, I mean, with Alex True turning into a fourth line guy, maybe we have a couple of questions to answer. We'll see what Kelman can do here. See if he can carve out a spot for him moving forward. We'll see what Alex True can do in the fourth line role. Although Sorensen's already back, so I'm not sure how much how much more time Kelman's going to be getting here. He still has six points in 15 games, which is pretty rough. So we'll make that change there. Move Marlowe back over, although technically that... First line isn't going to be as efficient. It's still a plus three, even though we haven't moved Marlowe back to playmaker, so that's fine. But I'm really intrigued to see it how well True does. Not an overwhelmingly impressive performance thus far, but he'll still have a little bit of time as Brodzinski is healthy, and we're going to have to send at least one person down, and I don't know who that's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to have to be True. It's going to have to be, because I don't want to lose Gambrell to waivers. Although, once we get to the playoffs, we don't have to worry about that. So, yeah, true. I'm uh, I'm sorry, buddy, but what do you have at this point? Is it still just two games played? No points in three games, a minus one. Eh, you had a chance. It, it, didn't, it didn't go that well for you, though. <laughs> so, sorry to tell you. 
So Swamala will be back on the fourth line. Uh, because he's a two-way now rather than a grinder, it's not a great fit, but I'm not going to worry about changing that play type back. We know we've already won the division. We're in a good spot. Uh, what if... I want to see what Gambrell looks like rather than Brodzinski. He's the plus one, which isn't bad. You know, we'll uh, we'll stick with that. We'll go Gambrell, Thornton, and LeBanc. And see what happens there. I mean, 15 points in the AHL isn't great. Ooh, minus 27. We'll see what he can do here, though, in a couple of games with some, you know, I'll say top-notch players and Joe Thornton and LeBanc. I think that's that's a fair title for those two. So we beat Edmonton. Brodzinski's 100%. We are up to 52 wins as Vlasic. We'll miss a little bit of time before the playoffs begin. We have two games left. This season, our regular season ends a little bit earlier than expected. We have handily won, handedly won the division. No problems there. 53 wins. But in the league, we are just off the pace. Two points back at the Carolina Hurricanes for the President's Trophy. Currently two points ahead of the Colorado Avalanche for being the top team in the Western Conference. So, hey, President's Trophy curse. I'm cool with not winning it. I do want to be the top team in the West, though. We'll see what happens here against Dallas. They are currently fighting for their playoff lives. They really need a win here. Hopefully we can crush their hopes and dreams, and we do with a 5-1 to one win. They're on the fringe at this point. And with that win, we have clinched the top record in the Western Conference. And the Hurricanes, though, yet to play, unfortunately. I was going to say, I thought they were going to have won. They didn't. So if we beat Anaheim, we're looking good. I think, I mean, we'll have more wins. I'm not sure what the ROW tiebreaker will be. We're at 48. There are 49. Okay, so if we win and Carolina loses or draws, or not draws, but, or, you know, ends up with a shootout or overtime loss... Uh, we are the President's Trophy winners for this season, and we lose to the Ducks. The Hurricanes win the President's Trophy in Season 1. We, though, finish the year, the regular season at least, as the top team. Thank you, Emmy, for doing the dog shake. Appreciate it. We finish, though, as the top team in the Western Conference, and I'll take it. 112 points, a 54-win season. Calgary and Vegas also make it. The Canucks just on the outside looking in, and nobody else in the division was close. So Anaheim with the trade for Chris Kreider, and that did not turn their season around. In the Central, Colorado, Chicago, Winnipeg, Nashville, and St. Louis make it. So Dallas, they gave up two first-round picks and missed the playoffs on ROW tiebreaker against St. Louis. In the Atlantic, Tampa, Detroit, Florida, and Toronto make it. So the Bruins... Missed the playoffs after giving up picks for Ron Hainsey. Oh, God. Montreal was just terrible. And in the Metro, Carolina, Philly, the Islanders, and the Penguins make it. Don't know if you can still hear the dog in the background. That's her way of saying hello. Emmy, you're killing me here. Would you stop? <laughs> the Habs, the worst team in the league. Columbus, Arizona, New Jersey, and Anaheim, the bottom five. Again, we finished as the second best team in the league, 17%, 70.4 on the power play, 79 on the kills. The so special teams, we might have to look at a little bit. Points per game, though, or at least goals four per game. We have the best offense in the league, nearly 300 goals. Goals against, the lowest as well. So, special teams play, not perfect for us, but all in all, you know, this team is, is ridiculous. It really is. And again, that was the point of what we wanted out of this series is that we're competitive from the start, try to win with Joe and Marlowe, and then retool on the fly to keep this team competitive while Brent Burns eventually starts regressing. Carlson, you know, starts to hit the twilight. And we'll see if whether or not we're able to do that. But for now, we're looking really good heading into this first postseason. Hurdle over point of game, Couture over point of game, Meyer with 72 points on the year. Evander Kane, I mean, slowed down a bit, but finished with over 30 goals. Marlowe, 59 points in 73 games. Jumbo, 45 points. Sorensen, again, not a top-line talent, 
but did well enough that I think it justifies still having him. I am, oh, this dog. Oh, this dog, you're killing me. We're going, we're, we're fighting through this. <laughs> what we're gonna do is still probably leave him there because it bumps up his line mates. Again, though, it's it's a controversial move, at least in some circles. Kevin LeBanc, 37 points. And then Radil, Carlson, and Goodrow all did well. Swamala, the one guy I'd point out as being a little bit disappointing in terms of the bottom six. He hit at least 20 points, man. At least. Kelman, those six points in 15 games. You can't complain about that, and he might be our top option from an offensive standpoint to substitute for the playoffs. Brent Burns is a monster. Eric Carlson is a monster. 24 points on the power play. He looks happy about it. Ben Hutton had a great season for us next to Tim Heed. Again, say what you want about them being the top pairing, but 66 points combined and a plus 63 combined. I think they're staying. I think they are. They played extremely well. And in goaltending wise, yeah, <laughs> that's the one thing that I'm very, very nervous about heading into the playoffs here. Around the league, we only had three 100-point getters, so scoring was down. Maybe we bump it up to high. Let me know what you think. But Ovi led the way, 57 goals. Malkin and McDavid, the elite class there. Like, obviously, McKinnon's still up there, Cooch, Crosby, and Stamkos. Goal scoring leader was Ovechkin. Kucherov, Kane, the other two to hit at least 50 goals. Brady Kachuk had a pretty damn good season. In terms of defensemen, Burns led the way. Latang was up there, though. Jake Gardner did very well in Carolina. He also had Ghost Bear up there. Goal scoring Kim was going to be Burns. Justin Falk, though, also broke the 20 goal mark as a defenseman. And for goaltenders, the winningest was Martin Jones, which isn't that surprising. You got Grubauer up there as well. Vassy, Anderson, Leonard. The shutout king for the hell of it was Freddie Anderson. Six. And the save percentage leader amongst starters. I guess you'd give it to Varlamov. I mean, Bennington didn't play in more than half the games, but he had a 922 save percentage. But Varlamov had a great year for the Islanders. Vassy was up there. Mrazek was up there. Carter Hutton, Grubauer as well. And for the rookies, it is going to be Capo Caco who ends up winning the Calder. Just completely outplayed Jack Hughes. 11 or 11, 16 more points. And 16 more goals. Go figure. But 28 goals for Capo Caco this year. He's going to win the Calder. I don't think the Rangers made the playoffs. But hey, you got something to be happy about at least. So with that, let's take a look. See who we... I mean, we know who we have in the first round, don't we? We do. It's St. Louis. Fun. Fun, fun, fun. Because St. Louis has never physically pained me because of a postseason matchup. We take on the Blues, lineup-wise, there'll be some tinkering around again just to make sure we're good to go, have it optimized. The good thing is Vlasic is back. And as you get a look at the playoff tree, it's Chicago, Winnipeg, Colorado, and Nashville, Calgary, Vegas, and of course we play St. Louis. In the East, Philly and the Islanders, Carolina and Toronto, the rematch of the 2002 Eastern Conference Final, which Steve Dangle botched on the most recent podcast. Detroit plays Florida. Detroit making the playoffs, by the way. And Tampa plays Pittsburgh. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope. I will see you in the next one. You know the deal. Support the video. Support the channel. I love you all. I will see you then. Can't wait for us to lose in the first round, probably.